4 o'clock on a Monday afternoon, and we begin with pictures from Sky 9. Breaking news out of Lakewood. Police are looking for a suspect after they say two women robbed a mail carrier at gunpoint. What followed was a confrontation with police that left one suspect and one officer shot. This all happening in the area of Alameda and Owens earlier this afternoon. Well, as a result of all of this, four Jefferson County schools went on secure status. Parents of students at Glennon Heights Elementary, Green Mountain Elementary, Denison Elementary, and the Fletcher Miller School were all notified that they would go through a controlled release once they had an update from law enforcement. We want to get to Nashville as well, where a community is in shock after a shooting at a private school ends with six people dead, including three kids. We've learned now that those children's ages in the last hour, they were all nine years old. Updates this afternoon from authorities say the woman, 28 years old, 28 years old Audrey Hale, was the one who went into the Covenant School and then opened fire. Nashville police are now looking into possible motives. They did confirm that the shooter was a former student and was armed with two assault rifles and a handgun. She was shot and killed by police, but not before taking those six lives. The school teaches preschool through sixth grade. The police chief said all the entry doors to the school were locked at the time of the incident. Of course, they're investigating as to how the shooter was able to get in. Police found a car nearby that helped them lead them to the identity of their suspect. They also found a drawn, detailed map of the school, including potential entry points that apparently she had done some surveillance on the school. Of course, at this time, there's still no motive that has been established. This happens just five days after Colorado was dealing with its own school shooting at Denver's East High School. DPS schools are on spring break this week, but enhanced security, including armed officers, will be in place when students return to those DPS schools next week. And one in four Colorado teenagers say they could have access to a gun in less than 24 hours. This is according to a research brief released today by researchers at the Colorado School of Public Health. And the concern isn't just about the amount of kids who say they can get a hold of a gun, but just how fast they can do it. Nine News reporter Katie Eastman explains. As Ginny McCarthy works, she sees the things she's trying to fix keep Numbers. happening. And that's the key is to say, we can do something about this. She paid attention when a student shot two staff members at East High and then killed himself. She pays attention to the school shooting in Nashville on Monday morning. And I don't think that we have a clear understanding of what is needed to address both mental health and firearms access in such a way that we, we could be effective and we could actually move change towards supporting youth and teens. To get closer to that understanding, McCarthy became a doctoral student at the University of Colorado, where she does research at the Injury and Violence Prevention Center. So this is brand, brand new. It's Monday's research brief published in a pediatric journal looks at adolescent access to firearms. We were surprised. Using data from the Healthy Kids Colorado survey, McCarthy looked at how more than 41,000 middle and high schoolers responded to one question. How long would it take you to get and be ready to fire a loaded gun without a parent or other adult's permission? The gun could be yours or someone else's, and it could be located in your home or car or someone else's home or car. 32% reported access to a firearm. Of those, 25% reported access in less than 24 hours, 12% reported access in less than 10 minutes. The American Indian and Alaska Native population was a group that surprised us in terms of access. Over 17% reported access in under 10 minutes. This time to access a gun matters. Research shows nearly half of individuals who attempt suicide say the time between thinking about it and acting on it is less than 10 minutes. I also think it's uncomfortable to talk about access to firearms. It's a very private issue for many people. But McCarthy says the conversations about safe access and what that means in different communities have to happen to keep more kids from dying. Katie Eastman, Nine News. Now that research was entirely based on data from adolescents. McCarthy says their voices are so important because often adults don't realize their kids believe they could easily access a gun. One resource the Injury and Violence Prevention Center points to is Colorado's gun storage map, giving people options for safe, safe storage of their firearms outside of their home. I want to return now to our breaking news in Lakewood. An officer in the hospital after a confrontation with two robbery suspects this afternoon. I want to get the latest now from 9 News reporter Kelly Ranke in Lakewood. Kelly? 
Hey there, guys. We just got an update from Lakewood Police. There are two scenes. One of them is just down the street, down Oak Street. We're at the cross streets of Alameda and Oak, and that is where police say that two female suspects came up to a U.S. postal worker, both of them armed, and robbed several items from his car. That is when those suspects, according to police, took off, and this is where the second scene is. According to Lakewood Police, officers encountered one of the female suspects behind this grease monkey. According to police, that female fired at officers and officers returned fire. Police say that the female suspect was injured, taken to the hospital. No update on her condition. The officer who was injured, officers say, um, has non-life-threatening injuries. They did recover one handgun from the scene. Police tell us that they are still looking for the other female suspect, um, and they tell us that these two suspects are Hispanic females, but they could not give us any more information about a description or an age. The reason they were called to this area is because that male poster worker who um, was robbed um, ended up going to a neighbor's house and called 911 to tell them about what was happening. Again, they are still looking for one female suspect. Uh, this is a developing situation. This happened around 1:45 this afternoon. So if we learn any more, we will be sure to pass that along, guys. Kelly, did police warn about any danger in the community? You know, we had asked them about that, and uh, again, uh, it didn't seem like they were all too concerned. There are plenty of police officers that are here in this area. That scene that is down the street where this all took place um, is, is still an active investigation. Um, that concern is not there, but of course, they're, they're letting people know. You know, if you heard something, saw something, please let them know about it. All right, Kelly Rinke reporting in Lakewood. Thank you. President Biden has declared a state of emergency in Mississippi as they continue recovery from Friday's devastating tornado, which the National Weather Service has confirmed to be an EF4, meaning it packed winds of over 165 miles an hour. You see the devastation, the storm flattening homes, tearing apart buildings and down trees and power lines. So far, that storm is to blame for 26 deaths. Mayor Eldridge Walker of Rolling Fork joined the Today Show this morning. He's also the funeral director in that town. He said he lost several friends as the tornado hit. Yes, I've lost several friends, several friends that I'm having to face their families to arrange funeral services. It's sheer devastation here in the city of Rolling Fork, Mississippi. But what's most important is that we take care of our families who are in need right now. The governor of Mississippi, the Homeland Security Secretary, and the FEMA Administrator all were surveying some of the damage yesterday in Rolling Fork. Tate Reeves, the governor, says the president's emergency declaration will help bring in needed resources as they try to rebuild. FEMA is promising to help the people of Mississippi for as long as it takes. Back here at home, taking a live look at Coors Field, plus a look at what it looked like this morning as snow fell around the metro area. Now to Greeley, they didn't fare as well as we did with the snow there. They've had two storms in recent days that both have brought at least six inches of snow to the area. Quite an active morning, Kathy. We knew this was coming, but it, it's we just need a break at some point. <laughs> I know we are in our snowiest month. As you know, Steve, this is kind of how it goes, and we're actually below average for snowfall for the month of March. We did typically see about a foot of snow. We've only seen a couple of inches officially here, but on a Monday, a cloudy, cold, gray day, and wow, that morning drive was tough. That sack, that second or last snow band came through right as people were trying to get on the road, and it was a mess out there. It's a tightly wound little system making its way over northeastern Colorado. The trend is for clearing skies for the snow to end. Ah, but with clear skies, good radiational cooling, we are going into the deep freeze tonight. We're going into the mid teens in downtown Denver, still dealing with snow on I 70. Winter weather and travel advisory still in effect for many areas. Temperatures are just cold. We're typically close to 60 this time of year, and we haven't gotten above freezing across much of eastern Colorado. Thankfully, the wind has died down because the wind areas east of Denver was almost blizzard conditions out on the plains for a while, and the wind creating high fire danger, if you can believe it. In southeastern Colorado, a red flag warning continues due to the wind, the lack of moisture as the system begins to pull away. So the heaviest snow bands will continue on that I-76 corridor, Fort Morgan, Akron out to Ray. We see clearing skies here. We get you a sunny day tomorrow. The kickoff of a nice warming trend that's going to get us into a weekend next weekend that I think you're going to love. So mid 30s now, upper 20s after 8 o'clock and in Maine weather. How about that snow ending sunshine and 50s for your Tuesday, but I've got 60s in the forecast. We'll talk about it and break down the extended outlook in just a few minutes. 60s. I like that sound. I know. 10 days to opening day, the home opener anyway. Too. I know. So, so. excited about that.
that. Warm it up. Yep. All right, Kathy. I'm on see it. In a, just a few minutes. The investigation is continuing after this weekend shooting outside of the Aurora Mall that left a teenage boy dead. According to the police, the shooting happened Saturday night after a group of teenagers were causing trouble inside the mall. Just before 8 p.m., someone shot a boy in the Dillard's parking lot at Town Center of Aurora. A uniformed off-duty officer working nearby then rendered aid to that boy, but he died a short time later at the hospital. Authorities have not identified the victim, but a family member told 9 News he was 13 years old. The shooting is a symptom of a larger problem with youth violence that's long been ignored, according to the interim police chief in Aurora, Art Acevedo. I think this is a, a, a part of what we see when we don't want to recognize that we have a problem. And the first step to fixing an issue, addressing an issue, is addressing, is, is admitting that, uh, that you have a problem. And we have a problem. There's no getting around it. Vaughn from our Nine Wants to Know team will have a closer look at the history of trouble at that mall and more from the Aurora Chief at 5 o'clock. Well, Sunday marked 48 years since Clay Rorix signed the first same-sex marriage licenses in the United States. The former Boulder County clerk went on to become a well-known ally in the LGBTQ plus community in Colorado. Now lawmakers are hoping to take that recognition nationwide. And Nine News reporter Jaleesa Irizarry explains. <laughs> What this world chooses to remember coincides with who they remember. So there's a picture. Inside the old Boulder County Courthouse, history frames those living out. We have to know our history in able to move the LGBTQ community forward. Marty Moore is the executive director of Out Boulder County. Today, she is a friend talking about LGBTQ plus ally Cleela Rorex, a former Boulder County clerk that got a handle on history. It was inside that building where those uh, first same-sex marriage licenses were originally signed back in 1975. So that looks like... It became a federal law last year, um, but it started right here in Boulder with Cleela's heroic actions in 1975. Neil Fishman chairs the Advocacy and Public Policy Committee for Out Boulder County. When Cleela died at 78 last June, he couldn't let her efforts go with her. The Board of County Commissioners proclaimed a Cleela Warwick Day for Boulder County. Now he hopes to take it a step further. So he's just we're brainstorming and it's like, you know what, let's talk to our elected officials. Colorado lawmakers introduced a resolution to create a national Clela Rorex Day. The resolution is supported by the entire delegation of Democratic lawmakers in the House of Representatives. Somebody really isn't gone until their name is uttered for the last time. And I never want Clela to be gone. If Clela had it her way, she wouldn't make history books. She'd say she was just doing her job. But in order to look ahead, the past must be present. Regardless of what's happening in the moment, we always have the future. And we can take the future under control if we continue to, to keep hope alive. Fishman is confident the resolution will pass the Senate, but isn't so sure about the House. If it does not pass, they say they won't give up. They will continue to try until it does. Tom. Well, they have a cause they're serious about. And when you think of uh, all that's changed in now nearly 50 years, uh, it'll be interesting to see see what kind of, the, of opposition they do face. Absolutely. And that's the thing that Out Boulder County says is that they never say no. They're used to opposition, so they're going to continue to persevere. All right, Jaleesa, thanks. Well, DPS schools are on spring break. Some parents, though, are making major changes after a student shot two school deans inside of East High School last week. And the NFL is hosting its annual league meeting this week. We're talking about meetings, guys. We have our Broncos insider Mike Kliss joining us after the break.